Brian, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Good. Thank you, Brad. It's good to be here. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, I want to start out. What, what's something about you that not a lot of people know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is like uh, I'm the like semi Asperger's part of my brain right now where I'm trying to think about what other people think about me. You know, I don't really know. I don't really know what people know about me. Um, can't, can't tell you. Can't tell me. Okay. This was supposed to be, this is your softball question, by the way. We yeah, started that, out with that, softball. That, that, that's actually not, that's a fastball <laughs> for me. The other yeah. thing that you think's harder is probably going to be way easier. Yeah. We, we need to build up to, to that yeah, question. You build up that. to these questions. Gotcha. Well, okay. Here's the softball question. I, I want to go back in time. 2010. Yeah. Uh, traveling to Rio with Phil Locke. I'm sure that's a, uh, you know, a fond memory that you have. Could you tell me about that trip and what went down? Yeah. Okay. So maybe this is something not a lot of people know about me. Here we go. I was buddies with Phil Locke. I met him through uh, other people like An Antonio or just playing poker in Vegas. We had become good friends. Um, he was kind of telling me like he had been to uh, Brazil, to Rio de Janeiro a couple times for, for backgammon, for hanging out, whatever, over the years. Like he's, you know, a few years older than me and was just telling me like, man, it would be really fun if, you know, you get some free time. I mean, at the time he had told me I, I, I had had a girlfriend and stuff and she probably wouldn't have liked me going to Rio with Phil, but you know. I didn't have a girlfriend at some point and was like, let's do it, Phil. So we took a trip down there, just him, him and me, backgammon board, like some bathing suits, whatever, like went to, you know, <clears throat> um, went to a couple places. Uh, but really like the, the second half of the trip, the second week was in Rio de Janeiro. And we went out one night just to some bar. And uh, when I was there, I, my wife was there and I met my wife, I think with, you know, four days left in the trip. Tell me, how, how'd that meeting go down? You know, we're at the bar. I, I see this woman who I'm, I'm like, wow, this woman is gorgeous, uh, like amazing eyes. And we kind of like locked. And to be honest, at first I was, you know, I, I, I locked eyes, but kind of like stayed there with Phil. And actually she kind of like came up and was like, started talking to, uh, t talking to us. We were also talking to some other people and then she like talked a little bit and went away. And then after we were done, like, you know, kind of talking to, you know, this other group, like I went over and uh, started talking with her again. And, you know, I mean, communication, it's already kind of like you're at, there's music, it's this, people are talking, it's hard in bars, but it was even extra hard because like my wife didn't speak English. And I didn't speak Portuguese, but my wife was fluent, was and is fluent in Spanish. And like, I took Spanish in high school. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, I, I knew some Spanish words and I, it's like, I, I was definitely not fluent in Spanish, but, but, uh, you know, the conversation at the bar was not like we were sitting there having, you know, a really deep two hour intellectual conversation <laughs> at a bar when we were, you know, drinking, mm -hmm. it was like a good enough, you know, we danced, we had a good time basically a little bit of like love at first sight we were together every every day like you know she ended up coming back we stayed with me for the the rest of the trip um we all uh, immediately started incorporating like google translate in order to like sitting back at the place kind of have some more in-depth conversations and and uh you know i went back home and it was kind of like like where's this gonna go right it's moment. kind of, it's so it's like fascinating to me like how how did like how this relationship can come about when you don't speak the same language it's like a meeting of spirits right like how do you know yeah. that some you have a connection with somebody when you don't really speak the same language but yeah but that's i mean really honestly probably pre you know 20 years ago or maybe 10 or whatever like pre translation stuff probably wouldn't have been able to happen but really because of Google Translate, um, especially like, you know, after we, after we went ways, like I came back to the US, it's like, where are this gonna go? I'm like, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna get you a visa, you're gonna come here. 
Obviously, I like immediately got started on that for a tourist visa. Long story short on that, like it was rejected like a month later because our government's so awesome. But, um, but you know, like we, we started talking online like every day and really she just write something in Portuguese and I would copy paste it in the translator, something in the translator and copy paste it back. And like that process basically started teaching me Portuguese, which I, I you know, I, I've been fluent for many years in Portuguese. Um, you know, and then when her visa got rejected, I, I, I was down there in January. I came back, I think like the very beginning of April. So I was already back like a couple months later, um, basically to see her on like another trip. I actually went with two other buddies of mine, uh, David Wells and all American Dave Swanson. If, you know, some people will know him from the WSOP sells those, sells those meals, but like, uh, <clears throat> And then, and then after that, like the next times I went down there, I was just by myself, right? Well, I think in May. Went what to did your friends Spain. think? What did your friends think of you? Uh, my, my friends thought I was a little crazy. <laughs> a little, but my friends, you know, like I'm just sort of one of those guys. I get my mindset on something. I'm like a pit bull a little bit. And that's just like what happens. Uh, and my friends kind of know that about me. And, you know, it, it, at this point, we've been married. We just had our nine-year wedding anniversary. We've been together for 11 years. So uh, obviously, there was something, you know, my, my wife's learned English. She's fluent. Her English is now better than my Portuguese. And, you know, she's been living with me in America, although we do go back to Brazil. So there was something there that was found in, like, the very beginning, like, just kind of, like, two souls meeting. And um, in some ways, like, there's a lot of communication that can happen. Obviously, I mean, listen, it's not like we never talked about anything. Obviously, through Translator, we talked about a lot of things about our life, about how we felt about a bunch of issues. I mean, you're allowed to get in, you know, maybe not 100% of the nuanced depth of like two people who are like extremely fluent, like born in that language. But, you know, you can get probably like 80, 90% of it. And you, you can cover a lot and still get a very good feel for that other person. But like, yeah, it's funny. We've even joked there. The joke has been thrown a few times in the course of our 11 years together where like, wow, I liked you more when I, be- <laughs> I didn't really understand like what you were saying on her percent, you know, kind of like when you're upset at the other person, mm-hmm. but it's like when I just see your eyes and I was like, Oh, I just have like that good feeling, like connecting with your soul as opposed to like, now I really know what you mean. Motherfucker. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Careful what you wish for. But, um, but yeah, no, so that, that's kind of like what happened. And um, I love my wife. She's an amazing person who like, I, you know, I think like one of the things I've, I've realized and I value about my relationship with her is my wife has really helped me grow and like become a better person and realize like a lot of my faults and like, and work on them and like, but like still love me even in like in spite of my faults, you know? And I think like, that's just such a powerful thing to have in life. There's like no substitute for that because, you know, we all have like all kinds of whatever baggage, things that are tough that have happened to us from our childhood that since we've grown up and what, and sometimes like, you know, you don't even really realize it. You're like, I never even realized I was like an asshole like this or whatever. And then, you know, you, you learn through like being in a loving, caring relationship with someone who like can hold you accountable too. And so I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's somebody that has your best interest in mind. And it just, you know, we're all flawed human beings, right? Like we all have dark days. We all have done things that we regret. And just having somebody in your corner that believes in you and loves you is just the most powerful thing. You know, the reason that I, I wanted to start here in this conversation, I had uh, Jason Kuhn on uh, about a month back. And, you know, Jason, like before he met his wife or before he, got together with his wife, you know, he had like 2 million in winnings. And then like, he goes on a stretch of four years where he's got like 30 million in MTT winnings. Right. And just talking about like how his wife takes care of him, how she's got his back, how she's like someone in his orbit. That's just always given without expectation. Um, People underestimate the value of just having an amazing human being in your corner that believes in you and loves you despite your flaws. So yeah, man, that's a, that's a, beautiful story and like it just, i just love it on so many different levels that you didn't speak the same language but there was a connection there and it worked out 
Yeah, for me, the, that math equation that you were just talking about, I mean, basically happened sort of with me as well. Mm-hmm. Like I had had some actually success and I had had, yeah, I had run up a couple million or something. Um, but, but I had a really bad like year, let's call it, like right before I met my wife, basically pretty well in like the online, but kind of started to party a lot with Antonio in Vegas and was getting like smashed drunk like a couple times a week kind of was knew that wasn't the time for me to be like grinding super hard the nosebleed game so I kind of like stopped playing those but you know still played some poker and then you know I I bought an apartment I put money into victory poker which all like poof disappeared I didn't know what that was like 200k plus I lost probably another 70k keeping the company afloat on the credit card Mm. like when I went down so anyway so and and I lost some backing or taking pieces. I don't know if it was backing. It might have been just taking some pieces. But I had some like some big pieces of people that failed, you know, for hundreds of thousands. And then I have, on my own, I lost like probably 500. So it's like apartment, you know, 400, like this, this. So all of a sudden, like, you know, I think I was some like just shy of two. You know, all of a sudden I probably had like 400, which I hadn't, you know, back to. I was like, damn. And that was like, and I was talking with Antonio about like no drinking bets and like, let's get life worked out. And that was like when I met my wife, sort of. Yeah. Right like, cause I, I met my wife like pretty shortly after we started victory poker, I just put the money in that, but it was just, so, you know, I had met my wife when I just basically probably been on the biggest like percent downswing of my career, sort of what if you, the apartment sort of doesn't count with that, but it does right. Like in a way. And, and, and this sh- mindset shift to really sort of bring that back into it where it was like I was kind of like a I didn't really care when I was on my own like I liked playing and it was a challenge but there were a lot of times like I had bad habits like I would stay in games when I was tilted and just like so- not a lot but like once in a while straddle or whatever I'd I just like I'd play and I'd be in a good like groove and be playing but then all of a sudden I'd overplay and like seven days later, I'd be like frayed and still be playing like 12 hour sessions and just kind of like not managing myself very well. Because when you're on your own as a guy, it's like, I don't really have any expenses. I don't really have any responsibilities. Like I know I'm good enough at poker to like win. So it's like, sometimes who cares? Like, oh, go out and get drunk and all this stuff. And then, you know, woman coming into your life. And even then, like, basically, she came with a a, a nine-year-old son who became mine, like he moved to Vegas when we got married um, and I like taking care of them and all that responsibility, it just like changed me. And that's sort of also basically from like before my wife, my career was like, you know, like, you know, I was doing fine and I was playing big games, but it was a lot of up and down. Kind of like after I met my wife, it was more just like up. Yeah. I'm not saying I never had downswings or whatever, but it's just my level of sort of discipline and responsibility kind of like came to new levels. And like, the truth is, is that's <laughs> discipline is probably if I was going to give a word, like the single most important thing to having a successful long-term poker career. It's like not your talent. Like you could, you know, as long as you don't suck, like if you're good enough to beat some game, if you're disciplined, you'll be okay. Yeah. You know? So yeah. And, and, and like you said, you know, lots of young men, don't have much discipline we make (laughs) especially your young man in poker you just make a lot of money and you just go get drunk and like whatever you you, you're living life kind of by the seat of your pants but um 2011 bad year for bad year for online poker right like 2010 you meet your wife um tell me about victory poker because i don't know what that was was that like a, a online poker platform launch yeah it was a skin dan fleshman basically knew a group of us in Vegas. It was me, Antonio, uh, Esfandiari, Andrew Robel, and Keith Gibson. And we were all like good friends. Um, And he was like, I want to start like a poker site slash it was more like a skin with you guys. And, you know, you guys will be the pros, like that whole kind of model. Like full tilt model. Yeah. And like, so we put up money and whatever. I mean, basically it was going, I don't know, okay-ish. I'm not even like really sure a hundred percent, but Black Friday, like stump, stamp, stumped that out. And like every, you know, and then 
we were like the first ones and then like some other pros i'm trying to think like uh lee mark holt and um maybe even dan no dan bilzerian was in there with us too and and you know i we, it's like odd because actually like the group that was picked like a lot of us have done pretty damn well in poker like since that happened you know if 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 doing well in the poker world is like make the site succeed maybe it could have worked who knows but like whatever it, it, everybody who put all the money and lost everything so it, it, you know it didn't, didn't work out very well and even us like the founders were like running you know we were like loaning the company money to like keep it running at the end off the credit card and you know then we, we didn't even get any of that back ourselves so it, it, it didn't work out no no one's super happy with the way it worked out basically yeah you know, i'll just leave it at that and luckily you know you met the woman that was going to become your wife. So you had like that thing that was going really good in your life. Um, and then black Friday happens, which is obviously a, you know, a clusterfuck of epic proportions. And then the WSOP that year, um, the 50 K players championship. Tell me about the, you know, gearing up for the WSOP in the midst of this downswing victory poker going under. Tell me about that. Yeah. So like trying to think, so I met my wife in 2010. So it had already been, a year and a half since I met my wife that 2011 happens, right? Mm -hmm. I think I probably was in Brazil. In fact, I was in May and I like flew back right as the WCP had already started because I basically won the first, like I flew back, I landed that morning. I was going to take a nap and go play cash later. And, you know, Antonio comes over to my apartment stops by my apartment because he lived in tower two in panorama or tower one and i lived in tower two he stops by and is like ras you're back awesome like let's go play the 1500 pot limit hold them and i'm like dude fuck off <laughs> like i don't i'm not gonna go play a 1500 dollars buy-in tournament man i'm gonna go play like 25 50 or 1500 cash later tonight or whatever um and he's like i'll i'll put i'll put you in uh, i'll i'll give you a 30 percent free roll and i'm like fuck off <laughs> he's like oh 40 percent and i'm like man 40 percent like one time free roll that's not bad but i'm like nah it's not enough and then he's like and i think it was like 45 percent or some something like that and i'm like okay fine like you know i just it's like he it's half of it was like my buddy like just really he's like my, He's kind of, he, he's like kind of strangely, you know, I don't know if you know him, but he's like weirdly nitty kind of with these things. He like never puts people in things. And like, you know, obviously he's pretty famous for his side betting and like the whole lot in thanks and whatever. Yeah. So I'm like, Damn, he must just really want me to come if he's just like doing this 45% free roll. So I'm like, fine. So I go play the, you know, this tournament. I, I, of course I win it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, so I, I saw, of course, I win the tournament where 1500 where my friends are putting me in. It's like, <laughs> he has, he actually wins more money than me on the, on the damn thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, but that, that was cool. And then cause I won that one, even though, you know, uh, I think at the time what we're talking 2011, you know, I was a very good ver relative to just everyone live, like overall, like no limit plus PLO. And, um, you know, I ha did not have very much mixed game experience at all, but it was like, you know, I played a few times online, probably played a couple sessions live of some mix. Uh, I was I'm sure I was awful at all the up card games, but I'm like, sold some pieces to some guys for the 50 K, uh, just at face, <laughs> just like, I'm going to play it. And it like my, I don't know. Most of my friends are just always happy to take pieces of me. In, in spots even like that where it's like you know i don't know how how much plus ev if any i'm gonna have in this tournament but i, I want to play it you know you want a piece so i sold pretty easy and played the 50k and uh you know I, I there was a little group at the table like andrew robel dan blitz and and antonio they all had pieces of me and and uh you know that, that was a pretty epic when that was my single most joyous uh poker moment Mm. it was like my first major win it was like i knew it was on espn the the victory earlier that summer it was like not even on like the thunderdome table yeah it was like <laughs> off somewhere else it was like i didn't even have i had 45 percent of it you know it was like first place wasn't that much and this was like espn like one point something million like friends are there like chip reese memorial 
Yeah, 80 80 percent of the stands cheering for Phil Helmuth. Like, fuck that guy. I'm gonna beat him. Like, you know, I, I, and also just Phil Helmuth, right? Like, super poker legend. Regardless what you think about him, it's like, you know, WSAP bracelets out the wazoo. Like, so it was it was just a really cool moment. The only moment in poker where like after doing something, I legit kind of like lost my shit and was like jumping up and down. It's never happened before or since. But do you remember what you're? Do you remember what you were uh, thinking or feeling in that moment when you took down the, the player championship? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but that's just like, what pure, are you thinking when you're just jumping yeah, up and down? Just and like, pure oh. excitement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're not really thinking anything. It's, but that's cool. It's like, it's fun in life to have, you know, those moments where you're just in, like, in the moment and, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's not that often for me where I really get like unadulterated feeling of like joy or celebration. So that was, that was cool to like have that for a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I, I believe you. I'm, I'm kind of constructed the same way. I don't really celebrate. I've never been a celebrator my entire life and I don't really know why, but it's always been kind of odd, like just sort of play a big pot and it's just kind of no reaction either way, you know? And I've always thought it was kind of weird when people like jump up and down and celebrate like, doubling up in the main it's like i don't <laughs> why are we why are we going nuts but um yeah man that's really cool i, I can yeah. imagine yeah i was no. gonna say go ahead no finish your thoughts sorry i was just gonna say i i could just imagine that like on the back end of like such a shitty financial 2010 and then black friday that that was you know probably a much needed shot of adrenaline for you yeah i mean Obviously, in the example you gave, like having that kind of emotional release mid tournament is uh, not constructive, right? Because like you kind of have to maintain the like the focus and, and attitude, and doing that wouldn't be good. But you know, I think the problem, and you probably would be with me on this, is that even oftentimes, like after something is done and it went well, it'll just be like, okay, great, like whatever. And the problem with that. And I feel like I have actually gotten a little better with this as I've gotten older in some ways, but it's still, it's like the bad emotional calculus that exists between like how kind of annoyed or upset you can be either at yourself or at your luck or whatever after losing versus like how you like don't feel that great after you win. So it's a tough place to be sometimes like emotionally, like with poker. So, you know, obviously learning how to like when it's done and you like don't have to be accountable to like, you know, be on point and be focused anymore. Like kind of like enjoy the moment when things go well, because like you'll probably feel a little bit the other way when things don't, you know? Absolutely. Uh, This is like a piece of wisdom that I've picked up over time. And when I coach my students, like we do mindset sessions, I'm constantly like, you know, it's so easy in poker to like play well for a while do something that you're like, what the fuck did I just do? Like just have an embarrassing hand in your database and then get down on yourself, right? Because you think the score is like O to one. And I, I try to tell my guys like, you know, give yourself props for making good decisions, right? Like validate yourself. Say like, that was a good sizing of my value bet. That was a great fold. Like that was a good over bet on the turn, right? So that at least when something bad happens, you know, the score is like 10 to one right? So you don't feel as bad, like try to maintain perfection and feeling like, you know, um, you're a loser when you make one mistake, because like, this is poker, you are going to make mistakes, like things are not going to go your way, you're going to feel bad. And you know, you need, you know, you need some uh, points in the win column to, you know, help keep you sane when things don't go well, you know what I mean? 100%. So like, Jason Kuhn, who, who's a friend of mine, and, and I actually both like and admire him like quite a bit um, per, uh, personally, but like he did some video for Run It Once a while ago and asked me and other people to contribute. And I ended up contributing something and I turned it into an article that I put on my blog. And it's essentially like the, the I think the article is about the spectrum and the spectrums sort of between self-critical and, and, and confidence, right? Where like, you know, uh, you, what you really want to do is basically be in the middle, which is like just being real. Cause like really what any gambler kind of like wants to achieve is like where you're just like perceiving reality as it happens and you're not like emotionally invested in it. Right. 
So it's like, you know, the flip side to what you're saying is that if you're patting yourself on the back too much, that can lead to like winner's tilt where you're like, I'm the fucking man. And I remember mm-hmm. I used to do this much earlier in my career where like, you know, I mean, like, to be honest, like back in the day, man, when I came up playing No Limit Hold'em, I used to be loose, aggressive, like fucking animal. And I, I used to just shit on people in like 500 big blind, whatever. And it was just like, there were times though, where I would get a little, little too much in <laughs> what i'm doing and what I'm away with and all of a sudden i do some hand and afterwards i'd be like yeah i don't know i don't know i might have been going a little too far with that one you know like and it so uh it's one of those things you kind of learn where it's like yeah you don't want to you don't want your the confidence to turn into arrogance you know and you don't want the self-critical kind of like self-analysis to turn into like getting too down on yourself and you're trying to find that middle ground where you're just being realistic about what's happening and perceiving reality and you know i mean it's almost, that's almost like a freaking like Buddhist type mindset here of, of, uh, you know, detachment. Right. But, but nevertheless, I mean, it's tough, but that's, that's where you try to be. And so, yeah. Yeah. It's a tightrope. Like you, you're trying to stay on that tight tightrope and it's like, you don't want to be delusional and you don't want to be arrogant, but you know, you, you want to just try to be as objective as you can. And like, I've always found it funny, like poker players, you know, it's like, we need to be self-assured so that we can pull the trigger in like kind of weird spots and have the self-belief that we're on the right path and that like our intuition is guiding us correctly and yet we also have to be self-aware enough to go back and look at those spots objectively and kind of see like am i losing my mind here like did i do something wrong um it's just a fine line of like knowing that you don't know everything but also believing in yourself that you know what you know and pulling the trigger in the moment yeah Although that knowing that you don't know everything, you know, nowadays, like tools are getting so good that you can, you can check a lot of spots in ways that you never really used to be able to, which, you know, it is what it is. It's reality. You know? Yeah. I, yeah. It's both good and bad. I, I think that like one, one of the things that has, have happened with solvers is like people misuse them and treat them like they're God and just ask the solvers a bunch of bad questions and get a bunch of bad answers. And then they go to the tables and they try to do what they think is right. And it's just horribly wrong. And I think people kind of get stuck in that loop of like, what am I doing? What am I doing wrong? Why am I, why do I keep losing when I think I'm trying to execute the right strategy? Um, It's kind of a weird thing where like you actually have to be operating on a pretty high level to use a solver correctly in the first place. Um, but yeah, it's a different world where you can just run a sim and like see an equilibrium spot and be like, oh, oh, that's that's what it's doing here. I'm <laughs> I've been doing it wrong for quite a while. I mean, I think the best like sort of mindset to go in with using a solver, and, and I have to be honest, it's not I, I've used them, but I'm not very sophisticated with it and haven't really ultimately put in that many hours. Uh, with, you know, and only with a no limit hold'em solver, right? PO solver, but at, at that. But, but like really what you're trying to do for is like the idea that you're going to just replicate what a solver can do by somehow memorizing <laughs> shit is absurd. Like really what you're trying to do is distill out principles that you can learn from and apply like as a human being, like, okay, so like when I raise middle position and button calls me and like this type of board comes, like who's going to have the range advantage and he has position. So like, do I want to be checking a lot or not type Mm -hmm. of thing? Or like, you know, this spot versus like a big blind defense, who's going to have a lot of like shitty hands. Like, what does this mean about how, how, how often I'm supposed to be betting on like this, you know, whatever. Like there's a lot of like principles that you can pull out that apply like pretty uniformly to a lot of situations. And, like that's really what you're looking for because as like a human being that's how you're going to remember it and make connections not like i see this fucking grid and i'm just going to do it like yeah. you know for like thousands of like flops and situations and like positions for this position it's like good luck buddy you know like that's not what's happening and and one data point changes and the whole solve changes like you play against one human being that plays different than the solver and then all of a sudden what you're trying to do no longer makes sense and it's no longer optimal yeah. but um yeah, just pull out the principles. And that's, you know, that's a major, I don't use them a ton either. I just know like friends and close pe- people who are close to me. Like I've always felt like I'm more of like a, an intuitive type player where 
I understand emotions and I can use those data points to guide my decisions. And I think other people start on the analytical side of the spectrum where analysis makes a ton of sense to them. And so solvers help them just in massive, massive ways. Um, so you won, you won the 50K Players Championship and then one drop happened. I believe it was a few months after that, right? When was the, no, or was actually not. It was next year. Yeah, it was the next year. Yeah, because it was like in uh Oh, you're frozen up. Oh no, no, I'm can you hear me? Oh yeah, I got you now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to go from like 50k to the one drop because I, you know, just curious as to like how hard it was to raise a million bucks for a tournament. Um, a million dollar tournament was something that like nobody had even considered before. It was just like this crazy thing tell me about that yeah so um it it wasn't that hard to do it did take a little while in a sense because i you know messaged a a number of people um i mean because i was not putting up like a a ton of money myself although i was putting up you know maybe i so you know, now we're talking 2012, you know, I had been doing pretty well. I had a good 2011, like things were going well in general. I had a little bit more money, uh, but you know, it's a million dollar tournament, <laughs> but uh, you know, so I forget what I put into that one. Maybe I put up like a hundred or something. Um, that's still a pretty small piece. I have a ton, ton to sell. Right. So like, Uh, I believe like months before the tournament, I sent out a bunch of messages trying to sell at um, a small markup, which, you know, obviously over like huge amount of money would get me like, you know, a little bit extra in there in addition to what I was putting up myself. Um, I I did not sell out at that markup. And then, um, you know, maybe I sold half. And then, and then in the couple weeks before the tournament, I, probably sold the other half and no markup like pretty fast. Yeah. So, I mean, so it's like that, that first one drop actually ended up being like an amazing tournament. That was like one of like, cause it was something crazy. Like only half the field were like poker pros. The other half were all like not poker pros. Like, I mean, that was just a really awesome tournament. That was the one Antonio won. Yeah, but that was um. I actually final tabled it, but um, but yeah, no, that was that was a that was a. I don't know. It was like also the first time it had happened. Gee's putting it together. It was just like so much bigger than everything else. Like people were talking about that tournament for months. I mean, I don't know. I knew I was gonna play that tournament. I mean, trying to remember exactly where I was in 2012. You know. That was sort of around the time that despite that mixed game tournament, I really wasn't playing. I don't believe I was playing a lot of mix yet. I was still, I think that was still in the time when I was still going to Macau. And when I was there, I was mostly just playing big deep stack, no limit cash games. I was playing. I thought we had just had black Friday. So actually I wasn't really playing PLO because I was playing a lot of my main game online, right up till black Friday was like cash PLO actually. And then um, I, I pretty much just quit at Black Friday. I mean, I, um, you know, I didn't leave America and just it was like, eh, whatever, I'm going to pl- just keep playing live poker a bunch. And I, I was going to Macau. So, yeah, so it was like for the, the one drop was like right up my wheelhouse. So, I mean, I wasn't like a big I hadn't put in a lot of tournament volume yet, but it was like, I mean, one drop, you started with a bunch of chips, like you started out really deep. And even the mix of playing at a table with like, pros and amateurs I mean also right up my wheelhouse because you know I wasn't playing like the biggest stakes online like 100 big blinds against like mostly only pros like I was playing like Macau 300 big blinds 500 big blinds some some very good pros and some amateurs and it was you know this weird mix because there's all kinds of like really crazy situations that come up when you have this type of dynamic right where it's like the pros kind of know what the amateurs thinking and then like there's weird spots that just never come up in like only pro games Mm -hmm. where people try to take advantage of that and squeeze or whatever it's it's pretty cool so it was like that just type of thing was right at my wheelhouse i i'm you know who knows i i bet i had 
you know, and even a lot of those guys, some of the guys from Asia, almost all the guys who, who came and played from Asia, and even a lot of the guys from America, like being a cash player, a live cash player who went to Macau, who also played some big stakes games in Vegas. Like I had played with all, almost everyone in the tournament, and especially all the amateurs, which is worth a lot too. Mm-hmm. So I would guess like my EV was just really good for it. And, um, you know, I, I had... I had a good day one. I built up some chips and, you know, managed to make the final table. I was selling, selling for the tournament. Um, you know, there's a lot of accounting, but it, it wasn't something where I was like that stressed about being able to do it is, yeah. is what I would, what, what I, yeah. Was there any anxiety entering, performing um, in a million dollar tournament? Was the energy any different than like any of the other tournaments that were going at that time? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, it definitely, it was like a bigger deal than anything else. Like kind of like, wow, like this is like, I'm, I'm coming for one drop that day. A lot, like some pressure that said, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm 39 years old. I've learned a lot about myself and I have just always been a person that does not like studying. I can procrastinate or whatever, but I perform really well under pressure. And it's just always been that way. As a kid, I was like an amazing test taker. I didn't study very much, but like, you know, I paid attention in class. I did the work and I showed up and, you know, did well on tests and like just poker, something about like, I've just almost throughout my career, I've almost always played my best when the pressure has been high. Now I I do a pretty good job. I would say of, you know, I'm, I'm, I've probably been really good about sort of overall bankroll discipline. Like even the thing you said, like Phil Galfin plays anyone. I have more game selection, you know, also just like selling pieces and whatever. So I'm, you know, I'm never in a situation where it's like a a huge amount is on the table and I'm super stressed out because it's like, Oh, it's 30% of my bankroll or something like Mm -hmm. that just doesn't happen. But, but um, so, which is, I think part of that, like, and that's an important thing, but, but yeah, no, I like a big spot. I've what I would say is, is it's like this, man. It's like when you play poker all the time, like I never call my a game. Like I'm just kind of like showing up and not tilted. That's like my B game. If I'm there and I'm sort of paying attention, but everyone's like checking my phone or this, but you know, paying attention during hands uh, and not tilted at all. That's B game. A game is like, I am laser focused, watching hands, getting read like, this is something that I don't think is talked about a lot by people, but I've always been really good at this. I call it like pre-preparation. And I, this is something that's much easier to do live because you have time in between hands. Like you think about all the dynamics that are happening and the adjustments that like other people are going to make to you based on what you already think they think about you and the hands that are getting played that session. And you kind of like pre say, okay, like I'm going to do this the next time because I think that, you know, and so it's just when I'm playing my A game, like all that is going on and I'm just like there. And it's that beautiful Zen, like being in the moment and doing it. And it's just, it's easy, like cake for like the one drop. I'm just on the A game, like the whole thing. Cause it's like a million. I'm, you know, it's the most I've ever personally bought into a tournament, whatever I put up like a hundred, 120 K at the time. Plus I've got fucking 900,000 of other people's money. So it's like, let's go, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you're a gamer. And like what, what you mentioned there too is like uh, Alex Honnold in Free Solo, right? Where he's like, you know, people say that I'm crazy and that like, I'm, I'm not afraid. He's like, but it's, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Like I'm very afraid when I'm free climbing, um, you know, free soloing these, uh, these climbs. And like, basically like in, the, in, the, in those moments, I feel like I'm most alive, right? Because like any mistake costs me my life. And he's just like loves that feeling of like, you're in the zone. There can be no other distraction because everything is on the line, like right here. And, you know, you, you mentioned something too. It's like something happens. I don't know. It happens to me while I'm playing cards. It's like, no matter the spot, I, I, I am almost never nervous. It's like, I could be nervous, like sitting down or signing up or whatever. And then once I, once I get there, it's like just something just blocks everything else out. And it's just like, I just have the decision in front of me, like, and that's the only thing that matters. And then, 
just try to make the best decision that I can. And I don't really think about the consequences, which I guess could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing, but it's just like, I always want to make the best possible decision that I can and then deal with everything afterwards. Um, and you mentioned the thing about the phone, right? Like checking your phone in between hands or whatever. Like you, you sent me a, a WhatsApp number in our pre-call. You're like, this is the best way to contact me. Like I have a flip phone. <laughs> I don't have a smartphone. Because uh, my smartphone distracts me so much. Like I, I get pissed because it like holds too much of my attention. So I've downgraded to like a flip phone. I had to get one of my guys in my community to actually reach out to you because I couldn't, couldn't have a WhatsApp on my computer. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, that, that was a great documentary. And I would say the, like, the parallel is like, yeah, it's not like in the moment when you know, I realized like, wow, maybe the best play in this spot because of these blockers is for me to run this like animal bluff raise on the river, right? <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that there aren't times when I don't feel a little like butterflies in my stomach, like, wow, am I going to just like pull the trigger for like 200k on this move right now? Uh, but then, but then it's like, yeah, man, like, if that's the best move, like, why don't you hold yourself accountable to it? And so hold yourself accountable and do it and what comes comes right and it's just like being in that like flow state and just like making those decisions and doing it and executing is just like a fucking beautiful thing and I've just learned over the course of my career when like that's happening and like things start going well because my brain has figured out poker better than like a lot of fucking people on this planet who all play and it's just awesome it's just like awesome to have that feeling uh and, and kind of be there and there's just no other, it's just, it's really enjoyable. Poker is like a really enjoyable, deep, complex game. And yeah, and it just, and, you know, I don't even want to say over my whole career, there's obviously been moments where I've chickened out and like not done it and regretted it later. Right. And it's just sure. so it's, it's like, so it's, it's not like the fear isn't there or the feelings aren't there or it doesn't, but it's that battle with yourself of say, of do, just doing and executing. And I, I almost even remember because I had this conversation with Jason, Jason Kuhn before. And I just remember telling him something about that of just, you know, like, you know, you've done the work, you know, like, and you just need to believe in yourself in that moment when you know, it's the right play. And yeah. I it was some one off conversation I had with him that he later came back and was like, wow, that was just, you know, like, really important to me at the time. And it was like the same, like, I had it when he had 2 million in poker winnings, and all of a sudden, Kuhn's like, crushing everything. And it's not like, you know, I, you know, Kuhn's, super hard worker, super great player, but you know, it's just, that is like a real thing. And you just kind of have to have that. And that's why it really takes kind of like a special weird semi half the time, like semi Asperger's type person to like be good at poker. Cause it's just that whole process going on in your mind. And it's, it's hard to get that. Oh, it's a, it's a battle. And I just, I find that like, uh, you know, and of course that's happened to me too. Like, of course I've chickened out. I haven't pulled the trigger. I haven't done things that I felt were good at the moment, but like, I always feel worse about that. I never feel bad if like I punt and it's just like, you know, I went for it and then I punt or whatever. It doesn't work out. Like I regret the times when I didn't, you know, when I yeah. thought that pulling the trigger was the right thing and I just didn't do it. Um, that's what caused, you know, causes me to lose sleep at night. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I was, I had a thought that I wanted to share, but it just escaped me, unfortunately. But yeah, uh, it might come back. You never know. Um, yeah. So what would you say is like the most unexpected thing that's come from your poker journey? <sighs> unexpected thing. Wow. Um, hmm. You can edit this, right? If I'm thinking about. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. What did I? I'll tell. Okay. I guess. Like when I was getting into poker, right? So I was a student at Stanford University, right? I, I Amazing college. Um I had, I had kicked some serious ass in high school to, to get in there. And, um, 
just started playing poker, like basically instantly had success. And I'm just, I'm like, wow, I loved the the freedom, the lifestyle. And pretty soon it was like, I'm just never going to work for someone. I just can't see that happening anymore. I did not expect things to work out as well as they did. Like when I got into poker, I had much more modest expectations of like, what I would be able to to make year to year and whatever. And I kind of thought I was really doing it for um, just life, lifestyle choice and freedom. And that like, maybe initially I might like make more money in poker than people that were like going a traditional career path and getting a job, but that like five, 10, 15, 20 years later, as people advanced, you know, uh, I probably would make less money over my life. And, for me, at least, that didn't end up working out that way, I think. I think, you know, who knows what would have happened if I got a degree uh, and, and got a job, but probably I wouldn't have done as well as I've done in poker because, like, things have worked out pretty well for me in poker, you know, and I'm grateful for that. But so that's kind of the unexpected thing for me, I guess, is I just, you know, I, I it's unexpected in the sense of, like, I always, always had this thing inside me where I wanted to challenge myself sort of like, even though I wasn't like, I'm going to battle anyone, but I always was willing to like try jumping up in stakes, not to like heads up play whoever, but like, you know, there's almost always spots when you're moving up where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to play almost any game. I just might not play like the really hardest game in like the bigger stakes, right? Where it's all the guys who I think are like, it's a four handed game with the other three guys are like the three guys who I think are the best. Mm -hmm. Maybe I won't play that one, but I'll play like almost any other game at that stake. Right. So Um, you know, and so I don't know, like maybe it's natural that things either would or wouldn't work out in that way because I have that mindset of like, it's, it's a challenge as well, but, but I I didn't expect to be as successful. And, and when I dropped out of college and was talking to my parents about it and thinking about on my own, I had much more modest expectations of my career. What do they think of the way your poker careers turned out? I mean, my parents are, are are happy with it. I mean, my dad is, my dad was sort of okay with me playing poker right away. Like he started playing a little poker himself. He got into it, read some books, like, um, realized like, Oh yeah, this is like, you can, you know, their skill, like, this is not a joke. Like, this isn't just, you know, people like, Oh yeah, I gamble at the casino too. I play Baccarat or whatever. It's, you know, not that attitude. You know, he did want me to finish and get my degree for, I think, obvious reasons that anyone would want their child to do at that point. Yeah. He got into Stanford. Like, what are you, what are you doing? You're so, uh, my mom did not understand it really. I think I, I, you know, it's been a while now that my mom has been okay with it. Like at some point when things work out well enough, your mom's like, well, okay. I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, <laughs> do it. Like I'm going to pray for you, son. Like, you know? <laughs> I'm still praying for you every, every day. But like, you know, I, so yeah. Yeah. What about your wife? You know, like y'all didn't speak the same language. Like how how did you go about explaining poker to your wife? Yeah. So my wife, um, my wife still doesn't like really understand poker. I mean, she doesn't really know how to play a couple of times. She's been like, Oh, teach me. And just quickly lost interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, she understands the basic concept that I'm, playing a game i'm not just like gambling our money yeah i'm risking our money but i'm not just like punting it on minus ev stuff and you know like she doesn't she doesn't gamble herself she doesn't go to casinos and she basically kind of just trusts me personally she doesn't have like a deep understanding of gambling ev and poker and all that but she understands enough of the idea about gambling and EV like, right. And, and she trusts me and that's sort of how, how it was and how it still is. And, you know, she tries to support me like when I'm going to go play through kind of her own like emotional support methods and has actually a number of times given me, you know, I, I, I've, I have spent a not, inconsiderable time in my poker career focusing on a lot of like tertiary things around poker whether it's like physical health mental like mental preparation meditation working with Elliot Rowe for a number of years now mental coaching but my wife has also 
contributed quite a bit there. Like I remember one summer she gave me this like mantra, mantra para prospera daji that was in like whatever it was in another language like an in, in Indian Buddhist style like mantra and I was listening to that like every day ten, you know oftentimes like when I'd be walking over during the WSOP to, to play and like during the beginning of the session and um even yeah that was the summer when I won the the 500k as well like I was listening to that on the breaks like so I don't, you were, you were getting something out of it right like yes and on the breaks I was like at the final table at my break I wouldn't go talk with the people on the rail, really. I would just sit by myself and listen to the mantra. That is you know? so sick. Like, that's, that's so incredible. Um, you still do the mantra? Yeah. And it's like, this is like, oh, oh, this is what I wanted to say earlier. I just yeah. remembered my thought. It's like the other thing about the, the performance thing, too, is like I even know in my life there's times where I'm really like in the zone and not in the zone. Like, you really, to really maximize the time you're kind of playing your A game, like it's such like a sort of precarious place you have to like hold yourself like I really feel good like I'm ready to fucking get these guys tomorrow and I didn't feel that way the last time we played a couple of weeks ago because it's like you got to feel good you've got to be happy you've got to like you don't want to have a lot of stuff that's really bothering you you don't want to be anxious about things you've got to be ready to like be in the zone and like not and like be carefree you also like you can't be raw emotionally, at least for me. Like I'm the type of person, if I get raw emotionally for whatever reason at the poker table, whether it's like an argument or, or, or sadness or like love or joy, or anything, it's like too much. Cause like, you got to go and dispassionately think about things. And even if like, I kind of like whether acquaintance or friend, like a number of people that I play poker with, but like when I'm at the table, it's like, yo, bring out the tool shed and bring out the knife. Cause I'm here to like fucking win pots versus you motherfucker. <laughs> Although let's have a drink after the game. But like you have to think that way. That's actually been a, and I know I like kind of overstated it there for dramatic effect right now, but that's always been an issue for me. Like even from like way back in the day, like sitting at the table, like I'd be talking to some guy next to me who I didn't even know. And if he chatted me up a bunch, I like wouldn't want a three back. Yeah. Like, deal with that. And like even a guy who actually taught me this incidentally is Antonio Esfandiari, <laughs> my good friend who has no problem fucking sh- shanking his buddies for like side bets all the time being a really close friend of him you know taught me that like for better or for worse like you can say like this isn't necessarily a great attribute to have personally but like in the poker world you need this you need to like be able to sit at the table and like execute and if that means pounding the shit out of somebody aggressively even if they don't like it like because that's how you're going to win the most money at the game then you do that right so you know and and you so it's like this weird place you have to hold yourself and it's I can just tell you now playing poker for 17 years it's like there's sometimes you're just ready because you're there and like other times when you're a little bit out of it and I can tell you I was not maybe feeling because I hadn't played a lot of poker and now I'm coming back I wasn't so sure of myself but I I feel pretty ready whatever it is like uh, I'm I'm gonna go sharpen in the tool shed for this weekend, man. In the hybrid, they're gonna you're gonna get. I don't know if I'm gonna win, but I'm going there and play some good poker. That's good to hear, man. And I'm with you. It's almost kind of a weird thing that happens. Like if you're friends, I just tell my friends, like, look, we're friends. I love you, but we play cards. I'm just gonna play cards. Like I don't. I'm not. I'm just gonna make decisions, the best decisions that I can make. Like I don't like the like soft playing sort of dynamic of anything it, it, it like takes me out of the zone actually it makes me feel weird like playing a hand differently than i otherwise would and i'm like I, yeah you're right like I, I don't like that um and yeah that whole thing is weird and i remember feeling that and having that be an issue many years ago when i was starting out in poker with guys i was friends with and at some point you just got you just like realize like the truth is when we're at the table we're competing yeah competing. exactly like, like, you know, like guys in the NBA or got this, like when you're on the basketball court, you're trying to fucking win the game. Doesn't you're mean to you're posterize your buddy. <laughs> so um, it, just, it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, all right, man. I got a, just a couple more, a couple more lightning round questions and I'll uh, get you out of here. I, I guess one question that I'm interested in is uh, what's your process look like for regularly improving your game? For quite a while, um, you know, I've always been a learning learner by doer. It's been Me my too. favorite way of learning. Unfortunately, 
Uh, I think with how good training equipment and poker is becoming, uh, that's not necessarily the best way to do it anymore. Although it was actually, you know, basically before solvers. Um, a lot of my preparation for years now has been around all those other tertiary things, like trying to keep my brain sharp, getting enough sleep, like getting exercise, like, you know, being focused, trying to make sure I'm in a good place when I go play sessions with Elliot Rowe, like focus as much as possible. Don't be distracted a lot. You know, I, I haven't done a ton of preparation. Like I'll think about hands that come, it's close. Sometimes talk with people, sometimes put in like odds calculators, Sometimes no limit run for to see kind of what what it says about the spot. You know, look at some preflop solutions for you know no limit big blinds, whatever. But I don't have like a really thorough studying process. I am at a place where I think at some point soon I, I I'd like to keep playing. You know, I don't know how much longer I want to keep being like an absolute like nosebleed killer. Maybe the rest of my life, maybe not. Obviously, you have to be a certain level of good in order to do that if you want to make money, which is how, you know, something that I'm trying to do when I play poker right now. So, like, uh, I, it is starting to have thoughts where, you know, like I stopped playing the biggest no limit buy in tournaments. I think that if I, did, you know, probably got some, the right coaches or did something, I could probably get back in there pretty soon. I think, whatever we would have to see, but that's not happening. So whatever, you know, with mix, will I, I feel like maybe I'm ready to add in some kind of regime regime. I know people are starting to do their own little private solvers for mixed games, which, you know, I haven't done yet. Uh, I feel like if I got in the right situation, um, you know, I would start doing some more like serious studying uh, probably would involve like a coach or a group or whatever. Um, but as of now, that hasn't happened yet. And uh, I'm just going to keep my eyes peeled with that. And yeah, but my studying regime is a lot. I'll look at pro poker tools. I'll look at some of the like starting odds for, for certain hands or situations. You know, I have a lot of kind of my own theories about like what's supposed to happen here or there. I have some ideas for like opening ranges in various games you know, so I'll, I'll compare some things to like what I think the, the right opening range, like say folded to like uh, RFI in some spot. And, um, you know, so a lot of that kind of kind of stuff, but um, nothing like overly rigorous, I would say on the studying, like I, every once in a while, I'll watch some videos on run at once or whatever. I, you know, it's funny, like I, I talked to Jason, right. And I asked him, because there's like a, you know, a Russian proverb comes from the one thing or they it's, it's in the first page of the one thing, but Russian proverb, you chase two rabbits, you catch none. Right. And so I asked him because he's about to move into this phase of his life where he's starting a family. Right. And like, you know, how are you going to maintain the elite level that you play poker while also being a great husband and, you know, a great father. And basically he was like, you know, I thought about this a lot and like, I'm just not, you know, I'm going to scale back my poker. I'm probably not going to play the high rollers. I'm just going to play a lot of higher stakes cash. Um, and, you know, if you took a step back, what would you be taking a step back for from the nosebleeds? Well, I've already taken a step back. I oh, mean, yeah? if you go back, like go back four or five years ago. I mean, I was playing nosebleed cash and high roller tournaments. I mean, there was a stretch. So, I mean, we kind of got off my poker career in 2012, right? But yeah. then if you look, like, basically 2013, I, I think I luck boxed my way into a million in caches. But I had some stretch from, like, 2011 to, like, 2018 where I'd probably still hold the record, like, most consecutive million-dollar caches. Like, now cashing for a million is, like, doesn't mean shit. And, you know, even by the end of when I was doing it, it wasn't that big a deal. But definitely, like, pre-2015 or so, it was not easy. Um, but it's just like, you know, I continue that because 2014, 15, 16, 17, like I did play quite a few tournaments. Kerry Katz started these like no limit high rollers in Vegas. So I could get like at least once a month, there'd be like three 25 Ks with rebuys, you know, plus stuff during the World Series in December and whatever. I did very little traveling. <laughs> I, 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 but so I didn't hit up a bunch of other stops, but just in Vegas, I could play like quite a few. And then maybe I do like one trip a year somewhere. 
or something. But, um, and so like during those years, uh, I, that was pretty awesome because like, I basically was experiencing getting to experience like sort of the competition in poker on the highest level everywhere other than maybe, you know, other than not maybe other than on the internet, but in the live domain, like big cash games, like of most varieties or the biggest no limit tournaments, I was like playing and winning in them. And, you know, so I've already scaled back because I basically made a decision where like, I don't think my spot's so good in the no limit tournament anymore and I know I'm not putting in work like a lot of the guys who I mean a lot of these guys who start, started crushing in the last couple of years because they put in a lot of hard work like I think I was better than them like six years ago seven years ago eight years ago right like in fact I think like you go back seven eight years ago for sure the best no limit holding players in the world in my opinion and I will like die on this hill were like the cash game players guys I like mean- Thurits and you know whatever I mean those guys were the crushers and it wasn't the tournament guys but like that you know nowadays there's so much tournament action it's like way bigger than the cash action I would guess it's probably flipped right yeah. because like you can do five ten million buy-ins a year in tournaments like if you're an amazing no limit holding player why the hell would you play like 50 hundred online like yeah you know so um but, you know, so a lot of those guys who are now like absolute crushers, and I know a lot of them, like they're friends of mine, but not all of them, but it's few of them friendly with or acquaintances with or whatever. Like, I think I was better than them seven years ago. And now they are better than me. I know them and hold them. It is what it is. And, you know, so I backed out of the tournaments. Yeah. So now you're, you're playing the mixed games. More yeah. And more. Um, just mixed I games. I backed out a little bit overall time. Like I've been spending a little bit less time playing poker too. Yeah. Yeah. And just, I assume spending time with your family, I mean, which is a very great use of your time. Yeah. And, and doing, just doing some other things, enjoying life, doing a little trading, doing a little, I don't know, a bunch of, bunch of little things got into crypto a bit in the last year. It's like, I'm a huge Bitcoin proponent. It's pinned to the top of my Twitter. (laughs) Um, I'm super bullish BTC, but yeah, just obviously that's looked pretty good in the last couple of months, but yeah. Yeah, Bitcoin's not looking so bad. Uh, pandemic, pandemic Bitcoin dropped to like 4K or whatever. That was, uh, I think uh, Nick Howard was in Atlanta and he was like, it's going down to 1K. It's going to keep going down. I'm like, Dude, I, I don't know. I'm <laughs> 5X since then. Um, that was a huge, like that was a massive deleveraging of the market. The market was very leveraged and that just... Like if you were leveraged long, you basically probably got liquidated on that move from, yeah. I mean, really in like a couple of days, it went, you know, exchanges went from, you know, 10,000 to like 3,800. Now it didn't spend very much time at all below 5k, probably like less than 24 hours. But I mean, like if you were leveraged long, you you probably got liquidated on that. So it was a, you know, it, it was a rough couple of days <laughs> it was a rough week watching uh, the ticker just plummet all well, the way down i mean the s p stocks like this it was like everybody was panicking nba shutting down like <laughs> it's it was like so weird because i was like i was following corona somewhat and i'm like it's like okay no one thinks this is a thing it feels like it's going to be a thing like and then all of a sudden it wasn't like a thing it was like the world is ending it's like it's so crazy like the way society operates it's like we're just ignoring this thing this like super transmissible disease that like almost for sure is gonna show up here and a bunch of people are gonna get it's like no big deal but then all of a sudden it's like world is ending yeah so, well, why don't you know <laughs> the the utah jazz dude's like uh wiping his hand like on the phones like as a joke you know and he's like <laughs> yeah. the first dude that that gets it like i told my wife i was like i, I i'm not a big like alarmist but this thing is kind of scary. Like this feels pretty scary when you you're asymptomatic for seven days and, and it's easily spreadable. Yeah. Um, seems like something. it's going to be bad. <laughs> it seems like everyone's going to get it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, or, or just like, it's, it doesn't seem like it's going to be contained. Yeah. It, the other and, reason too is it's not like super deadly. Right. Like maybe if it was like all that stuff and like a bunch of people are dying, people would have been way more scared initially. But it's like, oh, like maybe it's kind of like the flu, 
And it's like, could be one up to two weeks where you get it and you're asymptomatic. And it's just like, oh yeah, like this is definitely going to get passed around, you know? Whatever. Yeah. I-, I was looking at like the 3% death rate or whatever, like at the beginning, I'm like, that's not a small number. <laughs> that's a pretty fucking big ass number. Um, yeah, we, we got off topic, but uh, let me, I know you love books. If you were to gift all poker players one book to read, what would it be? Man. Well, one book. I don't know. I, I will tell you that the not exactly what you're looking for answer to your question of like what I what I really enjoyed would be the series by Frank Herbert, and uh, I really enjoyed um, <clears throat> A Song of Ice and Fire. I basically read both of them more than one time. Uh, like they're just amazing fictional works uh they're actually i guess not that strangely that i love both of them but they're both sort of amazing world creating they actually are written in the same format where each chapter is like a limited third person of like getting behind a character and you're limited by what they know and which is i think a really cool way to like jump around a world Mm -hmm. and um they're both like fucking geniuses who who wrote really interesting stories you know it's kind of funny in a way that like Frank Herbert basically didn't finish his, this magnum opus of his and died. And uh, after book six, and it's like looking more and more likely that like, I mean, I'm not trying, you know, to be too negative, but you know, he's saying he needs two more books and this like seven, uh, the sixth book for G- George R. R. Martin is like, you know, when is it going to come out? It's taking forever. And he still needs to write another book. And it's like, each book is taking longer. Like, is your guy really going to live another 10 years? He's like a little overweight. He's in the seventies. Yeah. Like dance, yeah. dance with dragons is like, Danny's still in Marine. <laughs> she hasn't even, <laughs> there's like no plan to get her back to the other place. Yeah. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. I don't yeah. know how he can resolve it in two books. It's tough. Like, I mean, he, he just kept making this world like so big and awesome and all these things going on. It's like wrapping the process of wrapping it up is going to be tough. And I think he's even probably a little daunted with the task, you know, um, himself. And, you know, now also maybe his motivation to like, really like be in there writing now that the guy's probably made tens of millions of dollars, probably a little bit less, you know, yeah. I imagine. <laughs> yeah. What does he care? Right. Like I, I read all of them um like right i think it was like season one of game of thrones came out and so like oh, I had, you read that early you watched season one and then read them yeah i was like oh i got like i love i love reading i love fantasy books and like i just it pulled me in and like i mean i remember where i was at when i read the uh the red wedding chapter like i was on a fucking plane and like was on my my ipad flipping it through and just had to like put my ipad down i'm like what the fuck just happened like they just fucking killed everybody. Um, I was like, I was at Commerce and like season three of Game of Thrones was coming out, and uh, it was um, Owen Crow was talking about Game of Thrones. He's like, he's like, man, I can't wait for this season. Like everything's going so well for Rob. Like he's getting married. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> you're fucked, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I love. I I started with the show as well, but I actually didn't read the books till after season three the red wedding after the red wedding i was like i've got to read these motherfucking books man like what the hell this guy is too crazy he just offed everyone that was like i it's like i remember where i was when i watched that episode that episode was unreal and like one of the things that was so awesome is like the show creators they were so good at adapting his story they kind of started going off the wheels more and more when it was like they ran out of his source material. They were great at adapting his story, and his story is like so fucking epic. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, that, yeah. the red Dude, wedding is just insane. Yeah, like, I was like, oh, I was feel like I had so much like joy inside, just waiting like for the red, like just like waiting for everybody to watch it because I knew that like their heads were just gonna explode. Um, it was such a crazy scene. Yeah, I remember like holding my wife or like crying like no like what's going on (laughs) (laughs) you know it's all that was god yeah that show it's such great television actually book three is so good like they they made they did it was a good call making two seasons out of book three because that whole story in book three is like so good with like Tyrion and the trial 
and and Ooh, the trial damn over in yeah and, that scene that scene got me too like i i read it and then i watched the scene and i was like holy shit like they nailed it i mean yeah. that was awesome yeah they nailed a bunch of a bunch of things earlier in the sh in the show when they were like trying to be a little bit more faithful adapting and 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 you know when they had the source material to do it yeah, yeah. I, I didn't like the last season <laughs> I, I didn't like the last season very much yeah i just hope we get george's ending you know, like that's, that's all I hope. Like, listen, I know a lot of people really didn't like it. I like, obviously the quality went off from like maybe the best show ever to like just a solid TV show that has a lot of logical gaps, but is like still entertaining. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think, I think the drop off some, you know, some of them, that's enough. Like I hate the show now or whatever. For me, I'm like, okay, it was enjoyable, but it's clearly not the same show. Yeah. But I just want George's ending. And I'm just like, let's eat your vegetables, George. Like, you know, take your vitamins, like do some exercise. Like don't do, don't do the Frank Herbert thing, man. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> yourself down. Like, right. He hates people saying it too. Obviously he's like, it's so morbid. Like don't die, finish your books. But it's like, it's, it's this weird thing now where because of like mass media and internet and everything, it's like, everybody is like part of this experience where like, you're the creator. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> Like, nobody knows George, really. Like, he's some guy. Like, I don't know him. I've never met him. But, like, I know his books and, like, love it. So, I don't know. Those would be my two picks. Sadly, uh, I was going to say, like, I used to read a lot more. The amount of reading I, I do recently because my brain has been fucked by the internet and, and everything is way less than it used to be because it's just hard for me to just read a book, like, the level of... Uh, <clears throat> focused concentration is tougher than it used to be. And it's so easy to listen to podcasts and get a lot of, you know, I mean, I documentaries, YouTube, it's just such an easier way to digest information, but I, I do enjoy reading still. Yeah. I, I, this is a tangent that the audience doesn't care about, but I do. It's a, I, I've been reading the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. And that's another book that goes from like one perspective to another perspective. And I love Brandon Sanderson because like dude puts a two year timeline on a book and like he fucking delivers at two years, like <laughs> 1200 pages it's done. Um, and it's, you know, I think if you love a song of ice and fire stormlight archive is just real good. Um, just, uh, we, we talked about emotions earlier, you know, and how like emotions affect us at the poker table. Like I read that book probably two weeks ago and went through like four days where like a lead character was like going through a severe depression. And like, I was depressed for like four days straight. Um, that was how much the book had just affected me, um, which I think is a sign of a pretty good story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a sign of a really good story is that you're really, you care about the characters or you understand the characters. If you don't care about them, you can empathize with them. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's an, it's an art form to, to really be able to do that, whether in a, a book or in a visual medium, but yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it's a really, to me, that's like magic. That's like the magic that exists in the world is just ability to tell mind blowing, amazing stories and to build worlds out of like thin air. Like that's just crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the other things that's happened with my book reading too, is like, I've started to get into watching TV shows, which really like, I was never a big TV watcher, but just more and more, it seems like there's just, I'll watch a show and I'm like, wow, like I, I'm really enjoying this, you know? And so that's become a much bigger way for me to, I don't know, say pass some leisure time. Like yeah. I'm, my, the current show I'm watching with my wife is The Crown. And like, that's just like pretty, you know, where we're both kind of into it. It's like interesting. It's like a little historical, but then obviously I, I'm sure taking some liberty, uh, you know, a fair amount of liberties with some of the personal stuff. And It's weird. I don't even like period pieces. My wife's watching the crown and I'm like, I'm not really into it, but then I'm like watching, I'm like asking her a bunch of questions. Like, who's that? Who's that guy? What's he doing? And I'm like, I like find myself getting pulled into the story, even though I didn't even think I was that interested. Like TV shows, I, I feel like TV shows have just, stepped it up a notch like they're just fucking good like i got me, me and my wife started watching fargo and like the first season of fargo was like i can't stop watching it's so good yeah um there, there's just been so many uh, like really strong tv shows i mean i'm trying to even think like first couple I mean, seasons house I, of cards 
Oh yeah, I, I, I House of Cards was good. I did stop watching at some point, but I got in, into a first couple seasons of that. I mean, Breaking Bad, my wife and I like really enjoyed that show. Um, man, I can't think of it. What's the show? My wife stopped watching this, but I finished it. I couldn't. But uh, it's it's like the this young hacker. Um, I'm not gonna be able to remember. My wife and I loved hacker TV show. My wife and I loved like the Americans. Oh, Mr. Robot. Man, I liked Mr. Robot for some reason. Like that was a great show. I've heard lots of things about Mr. Robot, but I haven't haven't invested my time. I can't like I get so it's so it's such an easy medium to just plunk yeah. yourself right in front of the screen and have it uh shot at you compared to like, you know, when you read, they've, they've you actually like sci-fi? Huh? Do you like sci-fi? I do. Yeah. Okay, do you, I mean, do you watch The Expanse? I, I have not watched The Expanse. Okay. I mean, I think The Expanse is like a uh, really strong sci-fi. You got to watch it. If you like sci-fi at all, you got to watch The Expanse. It's good. It's, it's, it's a good show. It's, it, uh, it's like, say like 300 years in the future and humanity's expanded to like have colonies on Mars and like the asteroid belts. And it's like a whole mix of like politics, characters, like adventure, whatever, drama, like it goes for more like hard sci-fi and a lot of things where it actually attempts like a really realistic portrayal of like how space travel in this little would be as opposed to like, you know, Star Trek Next Generation, which is like, uh, you know, kind of like magical technology, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but yeah, no, check out The Expanse. Uh, oh, it's good. This is the longest I've ever talked about TV shows on this show, by the way. But uh, did you, you see Love TV? Yeah. If- did you see Lovecraft Country? Did you and your wife watch What's that? Oh, you didn't you didn't watch Lovecraft Country? No. Holy shit. It's on HBO. Um that one and The Watchmen were like my two I watched Watchmen over the break. Lovecraft Country. Okay. Yeah. Watchmen, I, I, Watchmen was surprisingly good. I wasn't expecting very much, but uh I enjoyed it. I was really into it. I was like I watched all the episodes leading up to the finale. I was like, I gotta see everything that I missed. Like there were so many little little bits that it's like a puzzle, you know, that you Yeah you're figuring out in real time um all right a couple more questions <laughs> i know i keep saying that if you could erect a, a billboard every poker player's got to drive past on the way to the casino what would it say <laughs> uh well i mean is is it, are we talking to like brian in the tool shed sharpening knife are we talking to uh, you know hey guys like i'm trying to help you out like, <laughs> right in the tool shed is like uh you know the billboard's gonna say something like um you know you're never gonna be good enough but you know give it a good college try <laughs> <laughs> just hurt them prime them for losing on the way to the casino or, or yeah, like your your mother doesn't love you, so <laughs> go play some poker. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what, what would the billboard say to everybody if I'm trying to trying to be, you know, I'm trying to give everybody some good advice? Your would, mother doesn't love you. Um, it would say like, I don't know. It probably it probably it would it would have that little spectrum thing on it that I mentioned earlier, which would be like confidence self-critical and it's like try to be in the middle here and just perceive reality and uh and react like something very short like that but with like the visual of the spectrum i like your mom your mom doesn't love you i think that's i think that's the winner i'm gonna have (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna have my designer build that billboard with just your mom doesn't love you brian rast um (laughs) Uh, and, and then and then it's like the tool like i'm with the knife in the tool <laughs> a knife in the corner popping yeah. out the ev <laughs> i'm waiting <laughs> you know my poor man oh man final final one man where can the chasing poker greatness audience find you on the world wide web uh yeah i mean i have a website brianrass.com in which i have the blog i've already referred to a couple articles i've written um, you know, this one on the poker thing, you know, I've written about the environment. I read a really cool kind of blog that a gamblers probably enjoy about bike bets, damned Bilzerian's bet, 
this to the one I did where I basically did a somewhat significantly harder, uh, no, not somewhat, a significantly harder version of what Dan did. Uh, you know, like he had months to train, could use a recumbent bike and draft it. I didn't train, couldn't use a recumbent bike, only a road bike and couldn't draft. So, and I, you know, did 48 hours from Vegas to LA on a road bike. And that's, that's pretty insane. Yeah, it was insane. It's actually, in terms of like a, a single event, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You can't really compare it to like, you know, something that's like years or whatever, like raising a child or it's like, obviously those things, it's a different level of commitment. But in terms of like single thing, hardest thing I've ever done myself absolutely to the max, had to get in the mindset. It's like, I'm like, I'm going to die before I get off this bike. Like that whole, like I told you the pit bull thing that was in like full effect. Like, like my, my uh, son and my wife were there. Like, I'm going to show my son what commitment means. Like I'm like, this isn't about the money for the bet. This is about like, this is about proving, you know, like humans have been around for tens of thousands of years. And like back in the day, like life wasn't easy. You, you know, maybe in the, in the, on the plains, you had to like run away from a tiger or or survive or whatever. It's like, this is my, I'm running away from a tiger moment like I could get off the bike I could quit like whatever if things get, get really hard but like I'm gonna treat this like a life or death thing then I'm gonna do it right and get in that kind of whole mindset as I was going and uh yeah it was not easy it was it was very very difficult my body was breaking down in a number of ways <clears throat> but I I I gutted it out I mean I even had a, a doctor met me and I got like a cord- cortisone injection my knee was like really starting to bother me um, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to quit. Yeah. There's a, a friend of mine always talks about finding your limits. And I can only imagine that like after experiencing that and accomplishing it, like you, you had a newfound respect for your limits as a human being, right. And what you're really, what we all, all are really capable of if we put our mind to something. Yeah, no. And, and that actually getting to Dan Blitz's, uh, front of his house which was the end of the bet was like the other moment in my life where I remember like true and even more than the poker tournament like just true joyous like release celebration you know like I haven't haven't had the birth of a child yet so you know I don't know how that's gonna feel I'm sure that's gonna be like a pretty crazy moment but yeah no getting to the end of that bike ride was like I was just crying and my wife was holding me and yeah, it was it was tough. It was like so amazing to be to be done with that. But yeah. yeah. Awesome story, man. Um so yeah, there and uh Twitter, Instagram, whatever, Zarast, T S A R R A S T. Really Twitter's like my the main one that I use. Awesome, dude. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you for your time, your energy. Um loved every second of it and let's do it again sometime. Yeah, thank you, Brad. I appreciate having me on and uh it was it was a lot of fun talking. I I enjoyed the combo. Thanks, man.